Welcome to Tuesdays with Andrea. It's the inspiration station for everyday people guiding humanity forward. I'm your host, Andrea Rios McMillan, and every week I pursue conversations that matter with people who can relate to the common struggles we all face. You'll get to know the person behind the profession and find commonality with people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds. Listen as friends, neighbors, and coworkers offer meaningful, personal explorations of modern life and the values we hold dear, all for the purpose of strengthening and uplifting others. In this episode, you will meet Barbara Hernandez. She is a servant leader, a young rising star in the Democratic Party, and she's a daughter of a Mexican immigrant living the American dream. What I find special about her story is that it's all about the power of a yes. Her ability to say yes in the face of fear, in the face of feeling unqualified, in the face of being young and not even having the right clothes to wear. And I think it's also beautiful to recognize the sacrifice that her parents made for her success. I hope you guys enjoy her story. Chat with us afterwards. Message her on Facebook. Connect with me on the website or social media. I would love to hear your feedback. So without further ado, welcome to Tuesdays with Andrea podcast. Enjoy the show. Hello. Thank you for tuning in everyone. I appreciate you guys for for watching. I know you guys have a lot of options of what you want to watch online and I appreciate you guys for being here. I am your host Andrea Rios McMillan and this is Tuesdays with Andrea. This is a podcast about strengthening relationships and remembering the people who helped us and strengthening the everyday American worker. So today we have a very special guest and the reason why I I called her to to come on the show is because in this crazy, ever-changing, uncertain world, especially now when times are dark and we're going through a lot as a community, um, I call and seek the perspective of the real everyday working people that are shining among us. And this woman is one of them. So we have state representative of the 83rd district. Barbara Hernandez. Thank you so much for joining us, Barbara. I appreciate you for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about your bio and I'm going to read that really quick to the audience so they know for those who are not familiar with who you are. So Barbara Hernandez was born and raised in Aurora, Illinois. She is a first in her family to attend college. She graduated from Aurora University in 2014 and is currently seeking her master's in Aurora University in public administration. Barbara has been actively involved in the community since she was a teenager, and in 2016, she became the youngest Kane County board member, getting elected at age 24. Barbara is now the youngest Latina in the Illinois House of Representatives. What a huge accomplishment, Barbara. Um, that's crazy. I cannot believe that 20. So now you're 24, 27 right? 26, now. Oh, 27. Yes. And the youngest Latina. Do you get any award for that? Do, do they send you a plaque? <laughs> do they send you no. any? No, <laughs> no, but they're currently working on it. I guess in the Senate, they do have a statue of the uh, baby Senator. Um, so that is something that does exist in the Senate side, but not in the house. Damn. Okay. Well, <laughs> it should, it should. Because that's a, that, I think that's a very special accomplishment. Um, and today, what we want to talk about, so we're, we're, we're working virtually today. Um, we live not far from each other. She actually serves and represents my home city of Aurora, Illinois. Um, and we thought it was very important, especially with in shelter order, um, that we uh, conduct this interview virtually. And thank you for, for being willing to accommodate this. I know, you know, learning how to use the equipment sometimes and getting everything set up um, is a process, but it was fairly simple today, right? It was. Thank you for your help as well. (laughs) You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about your background um, and your, you know, rise to being where you are now, which is serving our city and representing our state. Well, 
I think my beginning pretty much started here in Aurora. I was born and raised in Aurora. I consider myself Mexican American um, and, and living in this country. Uh, knowing both uh, cultures, I think that's really important to have. Um, my parents came here in 1992, uh, three months before I was um, born. My mom had to hide her pregnancy in the airport uh, because she was already at the six month limit. And back in the day, I think now our things are a little bit different, but back um, the doctor uh, pretty much told her, you know, six months, that's dangerous. Don't travel, don't do anything. Mm-hmm. But my parents had this idea, this dream of having their kids uh, grow up in uh, in this country to have the opportunities that back in Mexico they couldn't have. Mm-hmm. So they left everything behind, came back, um, came to this country in Memorial Day of all days, wow. not knowing the language, not knowing that it was Memorial Day, what it actually meant um, in this country. And so they expected a lot of traffic, a lot of people in the streets. They came to realize that it was um, it was quiet. They it was hard for them to get a taxi, um, especially with the language barrier. Um, so they just asked the taxi driver once they did get one and said, "Hey, uh, what's going on? Why is this so quiet? Why is it dead?" Yeah. And um, the guy responded, "Well, this is a really important day for us. It's Memorial Day. We are, everybody's off." Um, so then that's when they realized that it was a big day. And for the rest of my life, that would be the day that I will remember. Um, it's like was, your birthday, basically. <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> yes. We would celebrate while everybody else would celebrate Memorial Day. Um, my family and I, we, we use that Memorial Day to, of course, celebrate others that fought for our country. But at the same time, to remember the day that my parents came to this country and everything started. Um, <sighs> Six months after um, they were already here, they uh, became undocumented. So that's pretty much where everything became uh, politically for me um, because I didn't know at a young age what undocumented meant. I didn't know that my family wasn't able to um, go to Mexico, travel. Um, I Did didn't you know? know? They- so wait, so when they came here, they were not undocumented and then they became undocumented? Yeah, so they came in in a visa and then I believe the visa only gave them six months to stay here. Okay. So they they knew all along they wanted to stay here. Um, so they came here legally, but then they just overstayed their uh, welcome yeah. the visa and they just stayed here in the shadows. And did you at that time, so when you're a child, you don't know, you don't, you really no. don't know what the status of your nationality and uh, yes. So what age did you find that out? Well, I think in an early age, I knew something was wrong um, mm-hmm. simply because my parents would always try to tell me um, just in case something happens, if you don't see us at home, don't be scared. Uh, we'll have someone take care of you. Really? Um, yeah, at an early age, it was it, it wasn't a clear image of hey, we're on documents and this is what it means. But they were it prepping was, you. They were prepping me just in case uh, um, something happened. Um, especially because my brother, well, he was is five years younger than me, so I am the oldest for from pretty much five years. And for the longest time, I was just hoping that I could become eighteen. Um, so and if things go wrong or anything, um, I could take care of my brother as well. I didn't want to be part of the system because my uh, my brother and myself are citizens in this country, so they technically couldn't deport us as well. Um, So that was another component to um, living with that fear and making sure that I I was ready just in case that I did um, had to take a job and sustain my brother and myself. How and old so, were you at that time when you first realized, mm, you know what, they could get sent away and it might just be me taking care of my brother by myself here. Like, how old were you? I would say I was pretty much a, uh, 13. I was 13 when I was thinking about that already. Um, when I went to high school, I was already um pretty much planning, figuring things out just in case something happened. I couldn't tell my friends mm-hmm. about this um, for the longest time. I, whenever you don't trust would, anyone. No, of course, you, you didn't know. 
especially with, you know, teenagers joking around. Sometimes they would say something that sounded wrong. Yeah. That didn't sound uh, appropriate. Like, give me an ex- um, can you give me an example of, of a, a standard comment that that might be? Well, um, sometimes in my classes, actually, whenever we would talk about politics and we would talk about immigration and so on, we had some hands that would um, rise and pretty much um, say, you know what, all, I think all Mexicans should go back to their country. And then you had me, um, who was a little bit shy, but after a while, I would just get heated listening to these discussions of people, of my own classmates, and sometimes Latinos mm-hmm. were saying these um, things. And I was just like, you do realize that it's not as simple as, let me fill out paperwork and I'm going to be um, welcome to this country. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work like that. It's not like go back to Mexico, uh, apply with the proper documentation and then come back in less than a year. Yeah, It just doesn't work like that. Yeah, um, There has been people that have been waiting for years, for more than 10 years. And yeah. and the immigration system, and more than twenty years, um, I had the opportunity to intern in the Congressman Bill Foster's office, mm-hmm. where I learned a little bit more about immigration. Um, a lady that is in his office for immigration only um, situations was that uh, sit down with me and go through the spreadsheet and show me the cases that are still open from nineteen seventy. Wow, from so people this, still waiting. Still waiting to get and went into through this the proper country. channels, went through the yes. proper channels, and it's still not legit, it's still not yes. approved, and it's still waiting. Yeah, and because that's what people because, don't understand. Yeah, and unfortunate as well, because if they had a child by the 1970s, it was one year old, and by the time they reach 21, they have to reapply and they have to reapply on their own because that child is no longer able to um, uh, be in this um, in that process. So that's another unfortunate thing mm-hmm. that it might take years, but then you have to restart because your child is now uh, an adult and he has to start or she needs to start her own application process. Yeah. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're a young girl, high school going through these fears and really living both sides of the story. You get to benefit from the public education system and being, you know, with everyone else, but still having to mask this side of you for fear of your parents getting deported and fear of your family getting torn up. And, you know, how do you deal with that at that age? And what inspired you to go? Is this what inspired you to go into politics? It did. It did. At that time, I thought immigration was the only one uh, single issue that needed to be solved. Uh, Quickly, I learned I was wrong. Um, that there were a lot more issues that needed to be resolved in the community, Uh Um, especially in the low-income community, the working class families that are working two, three jobs. My parents, my dad uh, is still working two jobs at the moment just to be able to sustain um, uh, a family of four Mm -hmm. in a way. Um, And it's difficult because we're first generation. We didn't buy a house until I was 13. Um, so that was a big accomplishment Huge for my deal. dad. Um, for yeah. the longest time, we lived without any furniture because we couldn't afford furniture. Yeah. We pretty much relied on people that wanted to donate furniture to us. And we would take whatever we could mm-hmm. and just make it into our own little style and um, fix it up and um, organize it. But that's what we had to do. Yeah. Um, in our family, um, other family were able to, of course, go to the grocery store, go to um, a, a furniture store and buy whatever they needed. But for us, it was a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that totally um, changed my mindset when it came to politics. Um, I did enjoy politics when I was in high school. Uh, at least my history classes were fascinating to um, learn more. Mm-hmm. But when I actually got into the community and started volunteering, started talking to people that were either older or younger than me, it did change my perspective that there was a lot of need in property taxes, Mm -hmm. a lot of need in in schools and Mm -hmm. funding of nonprofits, a lot of um, support on women's rights Mm -hmm. were also a big issue here. A lot of safety concerns as well. Mm -hmm. I think in Aurora, we we live in a, a beautiful city 
that unfortunately has a, a, a history of known as, um, at least back in the day in the 1990s when I was a baby, uh, about the violence. I think that's what has, that has um, tinted this image of the city of Aurora. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's unfortunate. And that's what I try to tell individuals, uh, young individuals, that because of the history that we have, we need to do better. We need to um, uh, go to college, go to trade school, uh, learn a little bit more of, of what we're interested in, follow our dreams. There's a lot of things that can happen. And just because of the history that we have doesn't make us who we are in reality. And you're a living proof of that, right? Like how you're able to rise above. What does your dad say about your position right now? <laughs> so he, he loves it. He actually... Um, He's, he's, does he walk down the street like, hey, Hernandez? He does. <laughs> <laughs> he, he pretty much, uh, when I was younger, uh, when I was in high school, he always told me that I was going to become a leader. Uh, I was going to be a, a politician. And I would always respond like, Hey, dad, you're crazy. I'm not going to do that. At that time, I was trying to go for pastry chef. So a different career overall. Totally different. (laughs) Yeah. And actually, two weeks before high school uh, graduation, I changed my major. I decided I couldn't go to Robert Morris University anymore. I didn't want to become a pastry chef anymore. I I wanted something different. Mm -hmm. Um, This was two years ago? Uh, no, two two weeks before high school oh. graduation. Okay. Was, okay. Yes. Um, and uh, I seeked um, a person's um, viewpoint about this that I also had heard from uh, when I visited her for the first time. And that was my predecessor, Linda Chapalavia. Uh, I went to her office at an early age. I think I was maybe 15 and uh, she, just to listen into uh, voter registration concerns. and. She looked at me and was like, so what are you going to be when you grow up? And I was like, well, I want to become a pastry chef. And she's like, I'm sorry. I, this is the first time I meet you, but I don't think I see that in you. What do you and think she, she saw in you in that moment? She actually told me she saw me in, in leadership. And I also was like, okay, you talk to my dad. This is planned. This is, this is not what other? it seems. They, they didn't, or at least my dad did go once um, a few years ago, I would say, when they were talking about immigration licenses for undocumented individuals. Uh-huh. Um, they did cross paths once. Um, it wasn't the most prettiest one because I, I do have to admit my dad is really, he's an activist on his own uh-huh. um, back, in the, back in the day, especially for immigrants, um, Im- undocumented Im- um, immigrants, that, well, he definitely fallen through that path Mm -hmm. so they met and my dad was just not happy with her vote and that's when I met her for the first time but years ago when I was probably eight years old maybe yeah um so I definitely didn't she didn't remember me and I didn't remember that it was her until my dad pretty much brought that memory and said you know that's the lady that we saw saw that um that day back in the few years ago Uh but during that time, I was just amazed of what she had told me. And I always kept in my mind um, of the reason why I had met her that day and why she told me that. Of course, when I left the office, I felt a little bit offended because I was like, oh, well, she's telling me don't be a patient chef. Yeah. That's how I took it. Yeah. And But I knew right away afterwards that, you know, I shouldn't take it that way. I should take it as an opportunity, um, as a compliment that she sees something else in me. So let me ask I haven't developed. Yeah. So in that moment when she saw it in you, did you honestly see it in yourself yet? Were you in that place where I'm like, I'm a leader and I'm going to change the world. Did you see that yet in yourself? No, I I really didn't see that. I I was really shy. I still am a a bit shy at times. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a, type of personality that I am. I'm more quiet than yeah. um, outgoing. Um, but I didn't see it. I think I saw it after um, I was president of three clubs yeah. um, in my, in my that high part school. Came. <laughs> yes. And then I started noticing that I, I, I wanted to help others. I wanted to make a difference uh, in everybody's life. And at the same time, give them the opportunity that um, 
uh, that maybe others couldn't give them. Yeah. And that's when I started uh, raising money for uh, conferences, for um, money for field trips for our uh, class, um, when it came to FCCLA, DACA, um, and then LULAC as well. So it was just a few that I was um, leader, a leader in, in, our, in my small high school community. Yes. Um, but that's when I started noticing that I, I wanted to keep leading, keep uh, allowing people to, to have the, the opportunities that they have and give them more that I could. Yeah. I recognize in, in a lot of people, when I talk to them, there's a moment where, especially, especially leaders in high position and when they're younger, you don't always recognize that part of yourself yet, but someone else does. And it's, it's crazy because the moment someone calls out your potential, it's almost as if it's, it's bound to manifest somehow. And then it, it gives you the ability to then rise to that in any platform that you're serving um, in, in your current, you know, where in that position you were in high school and you found ways and then to exude those leadership abilities. I think that's really important. Some people think and might look at you today as who you are today, public speaker, a leader, community activist, right? And they might not remember or know this wasn't who you always were or, or how you always identified. And I think that's important because we want to make sure that people know that who you are today doesn't mean this is who you're going to be tomorrow. And you're, I think, a, a perfect example of that. So going back to Linda really quick, because I know she was a huge mentor and a huge influence on your life. What made you reach out to her? What made you go to that meeting that day? I was talking to a group of, I think there was two people that we were talking about, um, about voter registration, the frustration that, that we had about people not wanting to vote, people not wanting to give, um, get the numbers. And the lady who was uh, the field organizer pretty much asked me, you know, we're going to meet with the state representative um, in a few uh, hours. Do you want to come? And I said, yes, not knowing what that exactly meant. Yeah. Um, I knew that was a big title and it seemed really, really important. So I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I'm not dressed for it, but I was wearing a hoodie. <laughs> um, but I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Thank you. So that's when we went and I knew that my place was just going to sit down and, and listen into the conversation, see what they were talking about, how um, things were being done behind the scenes mm -hmm. because a lot of people notice um, voter registration here we go you have the document and you fill it out and that's it but they don't really realize all the 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 behind the scenes conversations that you have with local leaders to make sure they're also doing their part to reach out to more individuals um, and help and and pretty much bring a little bit more trust to the the system Mm -hmm. that during that meeting um, that's what they were pretty much talking about the numbers how many people have registered how many people have not uh, what we can do to um, help others um, and increase those numbers because at the end of the day we wanted people to have a voice in yeah. the community so that's how, pretty much how it happened and from there it's just history I I was with her for eight years pretty much until the last day of her um, state representative um, cycle. And now we're here. And what do you think she's taught you? And how does one prepare to work in, in your capacity now? Well, I think back in the day, um, because I, I was an intern with her when I was 17. Mm -hmm. um, and then less than a year later, um, she offered me a spot in her office as her assistant chief of staff. Um, for me, that was a huge deal. Yeah, uh, because not only it was my first job, um, but at the same time, I knew. Wait it was a, a minute! Lot of Your first job was assistant yes. chief of staff. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, girl, my first job was McDonald's, <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first like legit job. You know, because 
non cash. <laughs> yes. It's, I honestly, I consider myself um, really lucky to have that um, opportunity. Of course, I had a, a small job before then. It was a uh, register people to vote, but that was for the summer only. And yeah. it wasn't m- much to do. But for my first actual job was assistant chief of staff. Um, and I took that with a lot of pride. And I knew there was a lot of responsibility behind yeah. that as well. And I even doubted myself a lot because uh, a high school student that just graduated high school got this position knowing that maybe you need a little bit more experience, but because this person trusted you yes. because you're also bilingual mm-hmm. um, and she saw something and you that maybe you still haven't seen, mm-hmm. but I learned pretty quickly of yeah. when I need to, needed to do as a female Latina. I knew that I needed to step up mm-hmm. at an early age. I knew I lost a lot of friends because of that too. Because a lot of my friends said, oh, she's already grown up. She's already an adult. She's already in this big position with a big title. Yeah. While I was still being the same person I was in high school. Yeah. Just a little bit more mature that I needed to be more professional that I needed to be. Yeah. Um, so that's where I did need to grow up a little quicker than usual. It was an instant grow up and as soon as possible, um, professionalism. Uh, you need to dress a certain way. Um, you need to, and that took me a while to get the gist of it. Yeah. Because I also never had someone that would tell me, oh, you know what, don't wear this, don't wear that, or shop here, shop there. It, um, so I, professionalism, I didn't know because my dad never dresses up for work. Yeah. He has a factory job. He has a, a job in an auto place. So he's always in overalls. Mm-hmm. So, and my mom, she's a stay at home mom. So I never saw in my household, someone dressing up um, for a, a job. Um, so I didn't know how that looked. So that's where I had to learn through others, through YouTube, through magazines to get an, an idea of how I can dress up for a professional job in an early age. Is that when I met you? Did we meet? I think we, cause we, you and I go a while back cause we mm-hmm. started we joined the Aurora Hispanic Heritage Advisory Board around the same time, right? Yes, I think it was around 2014. Yeah, so about what, yeah, six years ago, crazy. And by that time, though, you were already polished. You, I, you were, you were young, and um, but you, you thought wise. I, I felt like you know, on the board, you always had some great ideas. You were a contributor, a worker, um, always willing to help with whatever, whether it was social media, mm-hmm. whether it was fundraising, whether it was sponsorships. And I'm like, Hey, Barb, can you help with this volunteer event? And you're just like, yes. <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> I do. I do remember that. <laughs> we had some fun times, but it was, yeah. it was really crazy at the same time. It was, it, like I said, it takes a lot to do a, um, events behind the scenes that people don't notice. They see this oh. big event, but they don't see all the people like us that were working behind the scenes, just making it sure it was possible. And the months of planning and things. Yes. yes. But, but by then you, to me, you are already polished. You are already um, in a position of community leadership, in a position of having a voice for yourself and those around you and ability to make, you know, big, smart impact. Uh, even at that young age, I feel like this is a different generation and to carry such responsibility is not something that a lot of young people do immediately or right off of the bat. Um, What made you want to go to college and pursue that while you're still working in a really public role and, you know, getting, you know, getting paid, why still go back to school? Well, for me, um, it was something that was, um, pretty much placed in my mind since I was a baby. Something that my dad would always tell me um, was, you're going to college. You're going to college. And once again, you're going to college. Yeah, there's no, there's no was, question. <laughs> so I knew that I, I was going to college. Was that his goal for you? So here in, in, in America, was that his number one goal for you is you're just going to go and get a good education? Yes. He knew that education would open a lot of doors and he was right. Mm -hmm. He was right because education has opened several doors in my life. If I didn't go to college and I 
just was happy with the job that I received, I don't think I would have made it that far mm. because of knowledge of politics, a knowledge of history, knowledge of, of everything that goes around you it makes a huge impact um, in understanding a lot more in the community, but at the same time, understanding what actually has to go on in, in the political side, but more of the strategies, uh, um, the budgets, the understanding, the committees, how things are done. Because a lot of people are quick to say, you know what, just do this bill. It's easy. Just get it passed. Yeah. Just but do it. Don't, yeah. Just yeah, sign it. it. It doesn't, it, it's not that easy. There's a lot of things that people need to think about that could go wrong in the bill. It might be a great bill. It might sound amazing. It might help a lot of people. But is that amount of people that you're helping big enough that even if the small percentage of people are going to be damaged and who are going to be damaged? Is it the low income families that already are suffering and that cannot afford any more taxes, that cannot afford to go to uh, health uh, professionals for assistance? Is that the people that were damaging or is it the ones that were damaging uh, the people that have a hundred couple grand in their, in their uh, finances? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a big difference. And that's something that we need to think about because the bill might sound great and everything, but there's always unintended consequences that can go. How do you guys get to that point of wanting to support a bill and then do the research and the legwork to really make sure it's sustainable and the infrastructure is sound? How do you guys do that? Well, let me start off with, at least in Springfield, that what I noticed is we have 4,000 bills that come through our way every session. From January to May, that's when session happens. That's when we're all supposed to be in Springfield uh, pretty much every single week. This time around is a little bit unique. We haven't been in Springfield for a while because of health concerns and safety precautions. But when it comes to the bills, People have an idea. They have an idea. They write it down. That idea is given to researchers that can that know all the past laws, the laws that, like once again, we might not know about mm -hmm. that prevents us from doing this uh, or allows us from doing it. That might be a little bit more helpful. Once that uh, bill is already structured and paper, we if we like it, if everybody else is okay with it, that might have been in the room of the discussion. Uh, we sign off on it, turns into a bill, wait till it presented in committee. Hopefully everybody votes for it. If they don't, then the bill dies. But if it goes through and passes, then we will have an opportunity to pass to pass it in the in the house floor where all the bills are heard and everybody gets a, a voice to to vote on it or not. But even before, as a elected official, our job is also to make sure we talk to our colleagues and we seek support from them yeah. on a bill that we are really interested in. It's a lot of communication um, that we need to address with all of us and make sure that everybody is aware of those bills because we don't want to pass a bill that might not have enough support. Right. And when we ask, we call it roll call. When we do roll call and ask every single member, hey, would you vote for my bill? And, and this is what it does. And they say, yes, if we have the, and the majority of them, then we feel comfortable passing it. But if we're short a few numbers, mm -hmm. then we don't want to call it. And I, I don't want to say embarrass ourselves, right. but in no way, it, 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 we do feel a little embarrassed because we should have prepared more. Yeah, because you don't want to waste time exactly. pushing through a bill that is just not going to get supported, else it's, it's exactly. truly wasting time. I understand that. When you're looking at bills or when your constituents have an idea, do, does party lines matter at that point? Or is it more so presenting the, the idea and then, and then from there understanding the need of the constituents? How does this work? I think it's a little bit of both ways. Um, I think there's some bills that you would know automatically that you can ask for support in a bipartisan way. But there are some bills that, um, like, I would say the elephant in the room would be abortion bills. Mm -hmm. like, those yeah, type of that's... bills are a little bit more um, of an issue for uh, a certain individuals, even from my party. Yeah. Um, it would be, but at the same time, you know right away that you couldn't get a bipartisanship in, the, in those bills. But one of them that I'm, I am sponsoring this um, year is um, breast pumps to eliminate the sales tax of them. 
And that automatically became a bipartisan um, issue, which I was yeah. really happy to hear because I saw that Republicans and Democrats can come together on this issue that is uh, really important to women all over Illinois. Mm-hmm. And that would just remove the, the sales tax from them making those purchases from, from breast pumps? Yes, exactly. When people have an idea like that or you know, they, they say, hey, this should really become law here in Illinois. Do they go to you? Who do they go to? They can come to me. They can come to other representatives. There's some lobbyists that they have, uh, like clients that, and this is actually one of them. I was a grassroots uh, nonprofit that is called Purity for Pumps. And they are trying to just reach out to the whole nation, state, individual states, and trying to implement this not sales tax for breast pumps. And so the lobbyists reached out to me, said, hey, we have this great idea. We would, we would love for you to have this. I think you're the, the right person to have this bill. Mm-hmm. Do you accept? Do you not accept? And I took the, the bill, read it over, and I said, yes, I think this bill is amazing. It could help a lot of people. I want to be able to lead it through the, the process. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What issues are top priority right now? What can we be mindful of from a public perspective that's on your radar? Oh, yes. You know, um, I think three weeks ago, I could have told you um, that public safety, um, property taxes, and family-oriented bills like the breast pumps and um, feminine hygiene products and all these other bills, uh, criminal justice reform, would be the top priority for everybody. And there's, there still are, but now there's more of an economic priority that we have yeah. because there's a lot of uncertainty certainty of what exactly will happen. I think, at least for me, I know that we can't tax anyone in the future. If we want to have a strong economy later on in the few months, because of the economy that is now going on, um, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people are at home. I mean, I'm at home too, instead of being in Springfield working for the people. I'm still working from home. Yes. Um, It's just a different pace. But it's it completely changed. Now the priority will be the budget, mm-hmm. making sure the people receive the assistance needed financially, mentally, socially, emotionally, and just take those steps that we can take. I think everything else might be pushed back. I'm not sure. But at least in my mind, I, I'm ready to make those decisions that we need to make in order to help those individuals. Yeah, They're unsure about their future. So let's take a moment to address that because you've been very busy these last few weeks and days, especially as everything's unfolded with COVID-19 and its emergence here in the U.S. And especially now that it's growing in local cities and counties around us, what are the main concerns that people are bringing up? And are there any ideas or things presented now that can help us to better understand what we can expect going forward. I've been sending pretty much daily updates yeah. to nonprofits, to um, small businesses about resources that the governor or the federal government is giving out for, for them to get um, some help. Mm-hmm. Today, I have a phone call at 1230 for the, the governor's um, updates mm-hmm. to let us know what's going on. Well, how can we help? Um, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of things to cover. Yeah. But uh, my office and I have been working, like I said, remotely. Um, and my staff has been amazing. They yeah. came out with a, a whole two-page, three-page document on resources for all individuals, from businesses to um, the homeless, um, to teachers, nurses, and so on. So we have a, a system going on and trying to uh, provide as much as information as possible to everybody. But it's also, um, it's hard for me to reach out to everybody if I don't have their email address, if, yeah. if I don't have them in my list, if they don't follow my social media. Um, it's a little bit harder for me to reach out. And usually I would knock on doors, but right now I'm limited. Yeah, I can't knock on doors at all. Um, to see how people are are doing. So where can they go to get this information? Yes. Uh, So my Facebook is uh, Rep. um, Representative Barbara Hernandez. 
if you just type it in, I'm sure it would pop up. Um, and that's where uh, everybody can look at the updates. But if they want to sign up for my uh, newsletters, there's a little icon in the, I believe in this, on the left hand side that says join my list on the Facebook and on the Facebook and it's okay. uh, the constant contact and they can just uh, fill out their email address and um, they would automatically be subscribed to the new newsletter. Okay. And now I usually do a bi uh, monthly um, or bi weekly um, uh, newsletter, but right now with everything that is going on, I want to provide people with the updated information. So I'm sending at least um, two emails uh, per week. Mm -hmm. um, instead of just two emails per, per month. It has all the resources, so the unemployment uh, information, um, how to apply for the small business loans. Uh, there's uh, several um, from the state and the federal government. It also has a list of uh, volunteer opportunities. If you're healthy, if you are willing to help others, there's a lot of food pantries in Aurora. They're looking for help mm -hmm. um, to deliver food, to package food um, for those individuals. Um, and there's also a list of the schools that are uh, being offered. Um, they're offering lunches for their uh, students mm -hmm. um, that might not have an opportunity to have a lunch um, and, and at their home. Uh, and there's just a, lot, a list of resources that a lot of people can receive. Okay. So with the unemployment, a lot of people have been laid off and they haven't been able to file for unemployment. Is there a workaround for that at this point? What's your, your advice to those people who are frustrated right now because they did get laid off and they, they know that they need to file for those benefits, but they can't yet. And it's not like they can go to the office right now and also do mm -hmm. so. What recommendations can you give for them? Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are applying for unemployment that our phone systems are not ready as much as to receive that as many calls as they have. The network system also, um, it's been a lot of hundreds and hundreds of people who have applied yeah. for unemployment. So the governor is aware of this issue and he is looking with the staff to, uh, to find other ways of unemployment um, applications and being able to um, serve everybody. Uh -huh. But it is going to take some time um, I am going to be posting a list of tips that I found um, online mm -hmm. that was specifically made for Illinois as a, a way to, um, to apply for unemployment, the tips of what you can do and how you can make those phone calls. So I will be putting those up there that the ABC 7 Chicago was able to um, let everybody else know about it. So that's something that I'm hoping people get some help. But yeah. I do and, ask for patience. And it just, I think I read this and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So even if they were laid off this past week or the week before, they don't need to file for benefits that same week for them mm -hmm. to still be eligible to receive that back end pay, right? Mm -hmm. Is that true? So it, it was, um, it was extended the deadline. I'm not sure about the back pay just yet, okay. but I know that the deadline was extended uh, because there was, there's a big number of people that um, haven't been able to get to the system. Okay. Got it. But they don't. So I guess the biggest question, and maybe this is something you can bring to, to your governor's call <laughs> is <laughs> for those people who were laid off, um, are they going to lose money because of the fact that they can't get through right now? Or is there somehow going to be an allowance from the state that says, we understand this is an issue. And once we get to you and once you, you know, we'll make sure that you get the appropriate support that you're supposed mm -hmm. to get. You're not going to lose from this, you know, from our inability to be able to process the demand right now. That's mm -hmm. really, I think, the main um, question. That is. Okay. And then going back to the volunteer and giving, because I've had a lot of people come to me and ask about where can we give? Who can I help? What organizations are worthy and doing good work? Um, so you said your document has that as well? It does, yes. But okay, some of... The places I can go to, we have two food pantries in Aurora. We have the Aurora Interfaith Food Pantry and the Mary Wilkinson's Food Pantry. Mm -hmm. They need help as much as possible um, to package up food, to deliver food. To, they're doing a drive through process right now, so people to hand the food to the individuals. There's also Hesed House. Hesed House is a homeless shelter in Aurora that need a lot of people. They have a capacity of 250 they expanded to their third building now. 
because they don't want to say no to anyone. They yeah. want to help as much as uh, as much as possible, but they do need the help. They do need the the manpower um, to make everything possible. Are they still accepting volunteers? Are there volunteer opportunities still right now, or is it more so there donations? Is, yes, it's a little bit of both, to be honest. But volunteers are are really needed because, as we noticed, uh, there's a lot of people that are older that yeah. don't feel comfortable volunteering anymore. And that prevents them from going out and volunteering. But at the same time, there's uh, a lot of people that are getting sick. So those individuals that are getting sick are no longer going. So there's always, there's a big turnaround that needs to happen because there's a lot of people that unfortunately can't do it anymore. Yeah. And that is why they're requesting more volunteers. Okay. For anyone who wants to get this information from Barbara, do I call you? What's the proper title? Do I, Mrs. Barbara? <laughs> Barbara's just fine. <laughs> State Representative Barbara Hernandez. Uh, if you guys want that information, I'll also have a link to the website and social as well. Any other things that the public should be aware of, especially as it pertains to the stay-at-home shelter order? What does this mean? How long are we thinking? Do you have any insight on that? The governor placed a shelter in place until April 7th. It's something that we might have to look into uh, extending. Our focus is to make sure that we don't have anyone else who is infected and no one else dies. For this, that's why we need people to stay at home, keep that six feet distance, even with your family members. I know for my family, I've been, I haven't hugged my parents in weeks. I haven't been able to get too close to them in weeks because of fear that since they are older, that I might be, have something that I might not show symptoms because it can happen. You can, you can be a person that doesn't show symptoms, but you can still pass it on to someone else that is a little bit more vulnerable than you are. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to um, prevent with my family. So I keep my distance between all my, my parents and my brother. I recommend that as well for every other fam that we have here that is living in this situation. And if you do go out, also make sure you practice that social distancing and stay six feet apart from people Mm -hmm. Uh, because that six feet apart, it it makes a difference. If someone sneezes, if someone coughs, you'll make sure not to get any of that um, bacteria in your system. Yeah. But we need everybody to understand that this is really important. This is not a hoax. This is not us trying to control you and the meaning the governor, a government. This is us really wanting to make sure everybody is safe Mm -hmm. and that soon we can actually have uh, time to hug each other, to go to the stores, go to restaurants and have a social life again. I know I have a friend that is currently pregnant and for her, she, it's a big fear because what would turn into a a beautiful, wonderful um, experience for families and have everybody congregate in the hospital to see this baby, that will probably not happen anymore. Either she will be alone in the, um, in the hospital giving birth, or she might have one guest and that might be her husband. And that's our new normal for now. Um, and it's unfortunate to see because once again, we want to celebrate a, a baby's life and have a baby shower. And that's no longer a thing. Yeah, but it's all because we need to make sure we're all safe, mm-hmm. that nobody else is uh, spreading this virus. Right. And to see is that age is no longer a big. Uh, it's not just for old people anymore. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a everybody can get a, infected. Everybody in the world is getting infected. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who you are, what, how much money you have, what race you are, age you are. You're so at risk. Yeah. You're still human. (laughs) Yes. Yes. We're still all human and all susceptible to this virus and all able to pass it on and could potentially risk the lives of other people. Shouldn't we do that? Which I think is, you know, bears witness to the, the, the importance of staying home and, you know, taking extra safety precautions. Thinking about our first responders and our healthcare workers that are on the front lines and our restaurant, you know, providers who are still providing the food for those who are still out there working and helping and those essential service operators, 
Um, are there any ways that we can support them right now? While we're at home, what else might we be able to do to support those other people from a local perspective? I think one of them, the big one is stay at home. Yeah, there, that is the, it. Th- that is the, the number one thing that everyone can do is um, stay at home and you're helping a first responder, the medical uh, professionals do their job because they, they're putting their lives at risk as well. Yeah. With not knowing what can happen. One day they can be perfectly fine. The next day they can be sick and they will be in the same situation that we are excluded from everybody. And I think that would be more hurtful to them because that's their job. They, that's what they love to do. So if we already feel, feel helpless here in our homes, imagine what a first responder will feel. Yeah. So I would recommend everybody to follow the rules, stay at home. And at the same time, if you're able to, I think something that everybody can do, especially if you have um, young children, is do letters to them. Send them letters, send them thank you card. There's a lot of people that need assistance. If you're able to afford it, maybe send them a a care package to all of them. Send them a little bit of food um, or snacks or something Mm -hmm. um, that if you're able to leave a little bit and just hand that off to someone else, um, I know that would mean a lot to them. Just overall saying thank you to them, especially when this is over and we get to see them in person. Yeah. Telling them thank you would mean the world to them. Oh, and you're tearing up right now. (laughs) Yes. It's pretty, the sacrifice someone makes, it's, it's huge. It's really huge. I can tell that it really means and matters to you. And that's the type of leader we need, Barbara. <laughs> exactly the type of leader we need. Okay, so moving on, because I talked about the policy, we talked about your mentorship and upbringing and leadership ability. have been hearing a lot about the census. Oh my gosh, I have been bombarded with census. If you can just explain to me why it's important and what do you want people to do? But the census is something that came out on March 12th. I think everybody received a letter with the code. I would actually um, challenge everybody to be able to fill that census out. Because it's online. It is online. And right now we can't have anyone knocking on doors. So all the field organizers that were hired to do this are no longer able to do this as well. So it all, it's, it's all online. Um, and it takes five minutes. I think it has, has six to nine questions only. It doesn't ask anything about immigration status that is, has been removed. But it, it does help not only the city of Aurora, the state, and the federal government know what resources we need in our community. If we do not fill this out, we will see a loss of two, close to $2,000 per person, including children. If we don't, if we don't fill this out and we are underrepresented uh, um, in under, in the census, we are pretty much seeing a loss in benefits and not out of pocket, I would say, but you will see loss in uh, social programs and schools and infrastructure that could total close to $2,000 okay. per person. So what you're saying is the reason why the census is important, it's not because the government wants to necessarily track our ethnicity and our you know, mm-hmm. gender or age group. Um, really what we're looking to do and the, and the government is getting from this is how many people in your state need support and that's what's going to control the allocation of the dollars and the funding that we get down yes, the road. It does. Okay. And it also allows us to understand a little bit more of what businesses we can have in our downtown, um, in our city. If we see that we don't have a lot of people in Aurora, then there's no difference or there's no reason to have a, a Starbucks. Uh, not saying that we want one, but I'm, yeah. I'm just saying like, if people want these items to be in place, um, we, will, we need to show the numbers. We need to show that there is individuals yeah. that can afford this in their community. And we can have businesses that can help others and, and economically. We can't put a business here that might not make it. It takes a lot to just run a, a, a small business. I filled mine out. It's super easy. She's right. It takes two minutes. It's online. You just go fill out the information of you and your family members in your household and you're done. Don't even have to worry about that again. Going back really quick to the trillion dollar, the $2 trillion relief budget that was just passed. 
kind of relief can small business owners who are you know, struggling right now, what can they apply for? How do they know if they're eligible to receive anything? And if they are, what are they eligible for? So currently, um, it's still in process. But a loan, um, it has several loans for small businesses to be able to obtain. It's millions and millions of dollars that um, could be brought back into the, the, to the state and allocated. Families could see a, a $1,200 check in the mail for each adult and $500 for each student. Or a couple, if you have a husband, spouse, um, you can have uh, up to $2,400 as a couple. Okay. But in the state side, we have the Small Business uh, Association loan that mm-hmm. is brought up by the federal government, and that is already available for small businesses to get up to $2 million mm-hmm. in assistance. The Illinois Treasurer just created actually a, another loan for a state loan for small businesses and nonprofits to be able to obtain And I think that that application is already out in the treasurer's um, uh, website. Okay. Uh, And then there's also uh, three assistants that the governor just announced this week that would help with hospitality with uh, small businesses in Chicago and then small businesses in downstate. Downstate, when we think of downstate, usually we think below Aurora and just central and um, southern Illinois. But mm-hmm. this is actually something that Aurora does qualify. County um, is pretty much southern of Chicago is down safer. Okay. <laughs> Chicago pretty much. Okay. So that is something that everybody's able to apply to. And that is all in the governor's website as well. And I'll, I can give you that um, in, in an email. And then we do have the new um, Illinois uh, COVID-19 um, response fund. And that is actually a nonprofit grant opportunity for the whole state to apply for. Okay. So that is something that the governor gave $2 million of his own pocket to the fund. And then his foundation gave another a million to $2 million as well. Wow. So the governor has been also putting his own money into these funds. Yeah, I must say, I'm really surprised pleasantly by his handling of this all. I think he's shown extraordinary leadership and ability to, you know, be competent and then support the people, not only with resources, but with information and messaging that I think has been really timely in in Illinois, at least. And that's something I can really appreciate. Yes, he's done an amazing job. And I'm I'm thankful for keeping everybody up to up to date with information. He's been doing daily press conference at 2.30 and um, giving us calls as well as for all state officials. And then also individually and making sure that we're doing okay. And, and if we need anything in our community, that he, uh, he's able to understand and act on it as well. Yeah. Well, I know you are busy. I know this is a crazy time for you. And I want to thank you for making you know this call a priority and being able to show up here. So thank you. No, I just want to thank you for that, this opportunity. It's uh, an amazing opportunity that I, that I was able to talk to you more about not only my personal life, but also the actions that are going on. Hopefully it helps individuals. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know so I can also reach out to them. Got it. I'm sure you will get some questions. (laughs) Well, thank you. I appreciate your time and have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.